Tonight we're going to, um, you know, you've kind of looked at the Methodist Church Scripture, and then tonight we're going to look at our church and what makes us different um, than other churches in our community. And um, with everything that we do around here, we try to look at it through the lens of something in Scripture. And so what we're going to talk about tonight actually comes from the Bible, and I think we've got some slides for you um, that we're going to walk through, and it's... It's this couple of verses in the book of Acts that talks about the church and what the very first people who were in the church, what they did. And for me, um, this is the one moment in human history when the church functioned exactly the way God wanted it to function. And I would argue that the whole rest of the New Testament, after you get past Acts chapter 2, it's all about the church trying to get back to what it was called to be, and we still struggle with that. We being this church and every church still struggles with that, but I want to read it for you guys. You can follow along um, on the screen, or it's even printed for you in your book, and look at what they did. Here's what it says. <clears throat> they, that's the early Christians, sold property and possessions to give to one another who had need. Every day they commit, co- uh, continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying all the favor, uh, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Um, and what's really important with this deal is that there was a purpose for them to do what they were doing. And they had a mission, right, which was to tell the world about Jesus. And so this happened just within a couple of months after Jesus died and was resurrected, and then they got together. And so their, mo- their motivation was to go tell people about Jesus. That was their mission. And we have a mission here at Cokesbury, too, and that, you know, we've boiled it down to try to make it as simple as possible for people to understand that our job here at Cokesbury is to love people into a relationship with Jesus to change the world. And that comes from the idea that Jesus gave his disciples. He told them, you know, somebody asked him one time, what, what's the most important um, teaching in all of Scripture? And he boiled it down to two thoughts, that if you love God and you love people. And if you can figure out how to love God and then turn around and love people, that you're going to get life right. And so our job here is to love people. That's why we don't typically point fingers at people Um, We don't try to make people feel bad or guilty about what's going on in their life. We just say to everybody is, we want you to come and we want you to meet Jesus. And we believe that the more people meet Jesus, the more likely it is the world will change. Does that make sense to you guys? So your job is to figure out how to love people. It doesn't mean that you always have to agree with them. It doesn't mean that you have to embrace what they believe. But what it does mean is you got to treat other people the way you want to be treated, right? I don't know anybody who wants to be treated bad. We all want to be treated like we have worth and we have a sense of dignity and that we're important and we matter. And that's what it means to love people. (coughs) Um, And the way that we deal with this mission statement is then it breaks down into um, kind of some core values. Um, Some things that even for a church our size that we can all agree on are kind of the four most important things for us to focus on, and we call them core values. And the first one, um, if you're following along and want to fill in your blanks, um, is that when you get Jesus, you got to give Jesus. So the whole idea, right, is to come into relationship with Jesus, and then once you come into relationship with Jesus, you spend the rest of your life looking around your circle of influence, your friends, your family, the people that you come into contact with, and you help give Jesus to them. Now, another way to think about that is to look outward, okay? You guys see all the names that are written on the walls? Do you guys know what that means? Do you know why people do it? Have you ever written a name on a wall? Anybody? Okay. (coughs) These are names of people um, that were written up there by people who attend our church. So it could be somebody that comes on a Wednesday night, could be somebody that comes to recovery on Thursday, could be somebody that comes on one of our weekend services. Um, They have someone in their life that they are praying will meet Jesus this year. And so all of these names were written by people who attend our church. And you guys may not have seen it, but I have seen people 
actually come with the person whose name's written on the wall and they take selfies because that person met Jesus and they're celebrating that moment with each other. And so that's what it means to look outward, to, to, to look and see who is it that needs Jesus. They don't have to be a, someone that doesn't believe in Jesus. Maybe it's a friend of yours that's going through something and they're really sick. Or maybe somebody's lost, someone in their family's died. Or their parents um, are going through a divorce. Whatever it is, they still need Jesus, right? And so that's what kind of our primary goal is, is we want to figure out how can we give Jesus to as many people as possible. The second core value is um, saved people serve people. So saved being people who are in a relationship with Jesus. We go out and we serve people, and we believe that eventually when we serve people, they're going to end up coming to know Jesus. And um, when we're kind of boiling this down and making it even more simple, what I would say about that is just don't waste a second. Treat each day for what it is. And I know at y'all's age, there are a lot of days, maybe like today, that feel like it's taking forever for the day to end. But the older you get, and the more responsibility comes into your life, <laughs> the faster it feels like life's going to pass you by. <laughs> and it's so easy, I think, to, to go through life and not really pay attention to what's going on. It's just like huge chunks of time can just pass you by. And so what we're saying is, is don't waste any moment that you've been given. Because none of us are promised tomorrow, right? We hope that tomorrow's going to come, but for some of us, it may not. And so the only time you've got to live is today. And you've got to take advantage of every single moment that you're given. So our deal is, rather than getting up on a stage or standing on a soapbox or pointing your finger at somebody, it's better to actually serve them than it is to talk at them. And I don't know what that means for you guys, because all of you all live different lives. You've got, we all have some things in common, but there are a lot of other things that we don't share in common. So you gotta figure out what does it mean to actually serve somebody else. It could be opening the door for somebody. It could be actually stopping long enough to have an actual conversation with a friend. Um, it could be, you know, I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's going to see a neighbor that, um, you know, somebody that's an elderly person, you know they're alone. It may just be checking in on people. I, I don't know what it is, but I do know that finding a way to serve is a really big deal. The third value is you can't outgive God. And um, maybe a better way to think about that is to just simply be generous. Now, I know that most of you guys don't have your own bank account yet, right? But at some point, as you get through with school and you enter into the workforce, some money's going to come your way. And it's going to be real tempting to, to buy into the idea that you got to have more and more money, and that's the only way you're going to be happy. And what I hope you'll discover is that when you are able to use the money that comes into your life to be a blessing to somebody else, that that act of generosity is what's going to drive your life. And we want to make sure that as a church, we're being generous people. It's going to take generosity for you guys to get the game room, right? Because that stuff just doesn't... It doesn't happen by magic. There are no money trees. We can't just go pick that off a tree somewhere. Somebody's going to have to be generous on your behalf to give you something that I think is going to help you guys reach your friends. So I want to make sure you're being generous. And then the last one <coughs> to me is, is the biggest um, deal for all of us, and that's everybody has a next step to take. And... Um, it does not matter if you're five or 105. As long as you're drawing air into your lungs, you've got a next step to take. And for me, um, it kind of goes along with the idea of don't waste a second, is taking your next step means you're going to do something to make a difference with your life. Um, it's easy to make a point, right? Like, you can, you can um, post something or tweet something to make a point. Um, you can give your opinion to somebody, and that's really all it is. But what really matters in life is can you make a difference with your life? And you guys are going to have unbelievable opportunities um, 
You're gonna have to make a decision about what you're gonna do with your life and how you're gonna make a living. And it really, at the end of the day, is not gonna matter what you do for a living. It's gonna be what do you do with your life. And when you get to the end of your life, you're gonna be able to say that you did something that's bigger than yourself. And so your next step is really important. And for us, we think there's kind of about four big steps that we want all of our folks to take, and that would include you guys. And here they are, we're gonna go real quick. So it's worship, um, connect, grow, and make a difference. <coughs> we want you guys to engage in worship. Don't have to come every week, you know, the schedules are busy. Um, what you do on Wednesday nights is worship. Um, if you come on a Sunday, that's worship. If you're a part of um, Sunday nights, as you guys get a little bit older, that's worship. We want to engage on a regular basis um, with other people that are pulling in the same direction that you are. Then you got to connect, and that's stepping into a smaller group of people so that you can learn and grow with them. Um, and I don't know what that's going to look like for you guys. There's a million ways that you can connect with each other um, here in our church. We want you to grow, um, and that's um, continuing to learn about the faith, continuing to learn about Jesus, continuing to learn about yourself, and um, then finally make a difference, which is, again, do something that helps change the world. <coughs> now, it's, I think, really important to understand that, um, you know, I know you're at a place tonight that's called confirmation, and the whole point of this is to help you guys learn what it means to be a Christian, learn what it means to follow Jesus, learn what it means to be a member of a church, learn what it means to be a United Methodist. Um, but what I want you guys to hear me say is, um, you're not the church of the future, Y'all are the church right now. Um, if you're in a relationship with Jesus, you are a part of the church. And you need to see yourself as being a part of the church. The success and failure of us being able to tell people about Jesus, you guys have a huge part to play in that. You guys have got influence. Um, you've got people in your life. Some of you guys are the reason that your family goes to church. It's because of you. And I want you to understand that even as you're learning in this process, you got a part to play, and we could not do what we're doing without you guys. And so the question that you got to wrestle with is what's your next step? By the time you're through with this, maybe some of us are going to be in a position where we're ready to say, yeah, I think I want to become a follower of Jesus. Um, maybe for some of you guys, you've never been baptized, and that's going to be the next step that you feel like you gotta take. is taking your faith public and being baptized. That's a, a decision that you've gotta make and you need to talk to your parents about. Some of you guys are gonna actually join the church and become official members, right? So you're gonna, if you've been here on a weekend and you've watched somebody do that, you're gonna take the vows and you're gonna become an active member of our church. Um, hopefully for some of you guys, you're gonna step into service. Um, if you've been here on a weekend, there's a lot of people your age that do a lot of great things around here. Um, a lot of stuff with technology and running cameras and all that good stuff. You could be a greeter. Um, you could serve in another ministry. Uh, you can come to things like Christmas Hope coming up in a few weeks. You can serve in Manor House. Um, or maybe it's not something here. Maybe there's a way you can serve in, in the bigger community of Knoxville. And so maybe that's your next step. Maybe it's as simple as just saying, you know what, I've never read Scripture and just for the month of December, I'm going to read through the Christmas story with the rest of the church. I don't know what your next step is, but I know you got one. And there are a lot of important moments in life, um, moments you walked, moments you said your first word, the first day of school. There'll be other moments. You get a driver's license. Uh, you graduate from school. You make maybe a decision to go into college or to start a career. Some of you guys are going to go on and get married eventually. It's a huge moment. Well, your next step in your faith is also a big moment, and it's a moment worth celebrating. Now, you've got some questions, I think, in your book, and you guys are going to take a few minutes, I think, and just start kind of working through those um, questions 
together, and then we're going to pull back at the end, and we'll see what, what you came up with, okay? So what this is, you can ask any question you want anonymously, okay? So we ask you to write questions, whatever's on your heart, anything we talked about, anything about faith, church, life, whatever, and then myself and one of our pastors are going to try to answer all of your questions right in front of you, again, anonymously, cool? You can put your name on it if you want to, but all right, Stephen, you ready? I am ready. All right, here we go. First question, uh, what is an appropriate reaction for when someone cheats on you? Okay. So. I would go with throat punch. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that was a very appropriate one right there. All right, a more a broader question. How should we respond when, when our friends betray us? Can't yeah, that, that, um, that's a really painful thing when somebody that you love and care about does that. Um, and I don't have a perfect answer for that. I think the, the best thing you can do is, is go to that person and have a conversation. Because um, I know everybody likes to gossip, and gossip only makes things worse. So if you've got an issue with one of your friends, and even if it's just I heard, but you're not sure, it's always better to go to that person and say, this is what I heard, or you know, this really take me off or it really hurt or whatever. Does that make sense? It's always the first place to start in it. There's not an easy fix. It's going to take time to yeah. work through that. Yeah, and <coughs> probably hurts. So it's okay for you to be hurt, but then it's not okay to make a Finsta account and just post ugly pictures of them. And, you know, that's just not the reaction we need there. All right, uh, what do we do when there is a teacher that is the worst person ever and you just want to yell at her? When was the last time you were in school? Quite a while ago. Okay, all right. Yeah, a long time ago. Um, I mean, you got to go to class. So, yeah. you know, it's not... Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think that it's probably... It's, Y'all aren't going to like this answer, but I'm just telling you, I've been around long enough to figure it out. It's your job to get along with the teacher. It's not the teacher's job to get along with you. And if you want to yell at them, that's only going to make things worse. I probably wouldn't yell at them. Um, you just got to grind through it, you know. If that's happening to somebody in this room right now, semester's almost over. <laughs> Hopefully you'll get a new teacher. That's a really crappy answer, but that's... Yeah, that's a pretty tough question. Do? Man, well, I've had a lot of tough teachers. And like you were saying, I just put my head down and did the work that they asked me to do, just try to do it as best of my ability. And you know what? If they still didn't like my best, I don't know. I don't know what else I could so do. Much you can do, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I can't make that teacher better, but I can give my best effort every single day. Right. So. All right, uh, do we accept LGBTQ people at our church? We do. We accept everybody. Okay, it's part of that loving people in a relationship with Jesus, right? Again, a lot of people have different beliefs about that. And my belief and your belief may be different. The, what unites us and allows us to let anyone come to our church is that we believe it's our job to love people, right? I don't have to agree with somebody. I don't have to endorse somebody but I do have to love them. And so there are people who are part of that community that come to our church. There are people who are actively having affairs on their spouse that come to our church. There are people that are battling addictions that come to our church. There are people that screamed at each other on their way to church. Um, we're open to anybody who's coming to try to learn more about Jesus. Love it. Okay, uh, what kind of Bible should I buy for our home? I would buy the, like, they're going to legit buy it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the best. Um, you just need to buy something that's easy to understand. Um, there are two, two, two different kinds of Bibles, okay, and this is what you need to, look, to hear. There's translations, and then there are, um, no, not even Hebrew, just translations. So, like, um, New inter the NIV, NLT, I teach from New International Version on the weekends. 
And then there are paraphrases, so like the message, um, the living Bible. You got to stay away from paraphrases. You got to get a translation. But then you got to find a translation that's easy to understand. So not the living Bible, but there's a translation called the New Living Translation that I think, at least for me, and I'm not a super smart guy, it's easiest for me to understand that translation. And when I teach from the stage, I use NIV because mm-hmm. that seems to be the general consensus of most people on their ability to understand what we're reading. Yep. Uh, read and I use <coughs> NLT most of the time. So yep. when Solid you see stuff. it up here... You're most of the time you're seeing NLT, New Living Translation. Yep. All right, uh, what does remembering your baptism mean? Or what does that do? Well, it does nothing. There's no magic to it. Oh, okay. First of all, which is... Um, so, as United Methodists, I don't know if you learned about this first week or not, we only believe in one baptism. So you guys may have friends um, who go to other churches and maybe they've been baptized every time they went to a new church that's the way it was when I was growing up you had to be baptized every time you went to a new church we only believe in one now some of you guys may have been baptized when you were babies I was baptized when I was about your age so I remember it if you're a baby you probably don't remember that baptism so we remember your baptisms to give you an opportunity to do the exact same thing as if we were baptizing you the first time but it's just a chance for you to go I don't mean it negative, but to go through the motions to have the experience of being baptized, but we still only count one. Does that make sense? (laughs) Yeah. So there was some, like, because last year uh, we had 19 different students on Confirmation Sunday. Some Some were baptized mm, for the very first time. uh Uh-huh. And some... Some remembered remembered. their baptism because they were baptized as a baby. Yeah. Yep. So, and then uh, another question we had kind of uh, <coughs> wasn't written in, but when you are baptized, we invite the family to be a part of that process. Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. All right. And listen, y'all, it's a big deal to your parents, whether you know it or not. Mm-hmm. I've only had one time where I baptized a kid who was actually spending the night with somebody that went to church here. And that student was getting baptized, so he thought, well, I'll get baptized. But his parents weren't here, and so he goes home and tells his parents, I got baptized today at church. And they were like, what church? And why didn't you tell us? So if you're thinking about getting baptized, you really need to let your parents know that, okay? Got it. All right, we got two more. Uh, What is the next step I can take if I've already (coughs) been baptized? That's on y'all. I don't know how you live your life. Um, If if you're not doing anything to serve somebody, that'd be a next step. If you don't... um, Regularly read scripture, that's the next step. I mean, everybody's got a one, it's just different because we're all at different points in our journey. You know, my next step and your next step is probably completely different. Um, what was that's it, a tough one. It, well, you, you had a pretty simple statement one time. It's like anything that brings me closer to Jesus is the next step. Is the next step. Yep. Okay, so that's an easy way to think about it. If whatever you in are In fact, doing, I wish I'd said that because that was way better. Oh, you, you said Good that. Good job. Yeah. Good job. good job, you. Uh, good job, me. Remember, <laughs> thank so, me. Yeah, hey, you're welcome. I'm, we're we're ha- we're happy to help you guys. Uh, so anything that brings you closer to Jesus is the next step. All right, last one. Should I be nervous to see someone from my school at church? I hope not. What? Like no. It'd be great if you were like, hey, it's fantastic to see you, especially if it's their their first time. Yeah, we should be hopefully inviting people from your school here to church. And you should be the same person at school as you are at church, as you are in the grocery store, as you are at home. You don't have to be anybody other than yourself right here in this place. Yep. And I would think, well, except for confirmations, it'd probably be a little weird. (laughs) But I would think it would be easier to invite your friends to come with you on a Wednesday night than it is to come on a Sunday or a Saturday night. Um, So... It's a great opportunity. There and you don't go. come if you ask You them. know a great time to invite somebody would be to Pajamas and Pancakes exactly. December 11th. Exactly. We will do uh, all celebrate Christmas uh, together. Uh, hey, let's thank Stephen one more time. Give him a big hand. Thanks for being here. All right. Uh, we will not meet next week because it will be the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So have a wonderful Thanksgiving. We've got a few minutes left. So if you want to play nine square or basketball, you may be sure to put your books back uh, in your uh, boxes there. See you in two weeks. And if I didn't get to your question tonight, top of the list for two weeks.